All right, so welcome back. Uh, so the topic for today is going to be uh, numerical criteria for ample divisors. Today, I want to look into more detail at some of the statements that I've been kind of taking for granted already. So specifically, I told you that we have, you know, let's not worry about big for today. So we have nef, nef divisor, which, be, which we define to be one which is uh, has a non-negative intersection with all effective curves. E dot C greater than zero for all curves. And then an ample divisor. Well, there are a lot of definitions of this. Basically, you know, if you read Hartshorn, there's the this is defined in terms of global generation. If you an ample divisor is one that's positive enough that when you Tensor it enough times with any sheaf, any coherent sheaf, you get something that's globally generated. But you can also show that's equivalent in this definition we've been kind of using uh, to some multiple of that divisor, some power of that divisor, this is a tensor product, um, is very ample. So it induces an embedding through variety into projective space. So, but today, well, Essentially, what we'd like to say is that this is what you get when you replace the greater than or equal to zero with a greater than, but it's, that's not quite true for reasons we'll see later. Um, but uh, but the, the correct statement is that you know this these conditions they give you a cone. You know these are inequalities that that uh, preserved by scaling, and they're convex. It's sort of that's pretty clear. So then anything that satisfy any two divisors that satisfy these conditions then a positive linear combination will also satisfy that. And that gives you a convex cone. The ample divisors are the interior of the net cone. And I want to explore how we derive a statement like this. Um, and I'm going to follow the presentation for bits of the presentation uh, in Lazarsfeld's book, uh, Positivity and Algebraic Geometry. So this is all stuff that's in the first chapter of that book, so, you know, we're not getting too crazy, but uh, basically what I want to do is prove a couple of results. Um, so the first thing I want to, I want to prove is kind of a small result. You might even just call it an example or a lemma, is that the uh, is that for given uh, x and projective variety, and you know most of the time I'm just going to assume x is smooth. I mean, if, you know, we're never going to like work with singular x where the singularities are too bad. But I don't want to like state the singularity conditions I'm I'm invoking. So. Um, you know, in general, I will just give the arguments for smooth and projective varieties, and then if we need them for something else, then I'll refer you to the book. So uh, the idea is that given Cartier divisor d on x, then we can always write d as the difference of two ample or even very ample divisors. So we can find very ample divisors A and B such that D is linearly equivalent um, I mean, usually I would just write equal, or let's just say it's a tilde, um, and this is linear equivalence because, you know, a lot of what we're going to be thinking about today is numerical equivalence, so I'm 
I'll make the distinction. Um, and I'm going to say that it's equivalent to the difference. Okay, so this is kind of a small technical result, but like an extremely useful one. So let me just show you how you prove something like this. And this is where the geometric characterization of AMBLE becomes very useful. So here's the idea. Uh, so we, uh, proof. Uh, so we're going to choose H, uh, an AMBLE divisor. then so for large enough m then I have uh, if I take m h well this is certainly going to be I mean it'll be very ample because I have an ample divisor so m h will be very ample maybe we'll make this m1 h so for large enough m1 and m2 and then we can say that M2H, well, we also want this to be very ample. And I want M2H plus B. Well, I can't immediately guarantee this is ample or anything, because that's what we're trying to prove, essentially, right? Is that, you know, if I take another way to, to, to think about this is, to, is just to say, well, I'm taking some ample divisor and perturbing it by B, and then I get another ample divisor. So I can't claim this is ample, but I do know that, you know, just by the, the other definition of ample, that this is globally generated. So it's a base point free linear series. Base point free. And then you can just combine these to get two very ample divisors. And the way that works is that, you know, I have x, so one linear series, just the m1h gets me into some projective space, so uh, p, let's just call this n1, and then the other linear series, let's just use the m2h uh, plus a d, this is base point free, so this is a well-defined map, it gets me into another projective space, and this was, one is an embedding. Well, you know, just the usual, and of course these just you know, sit over, you know, of the point. And, you know, because, like, I can't, it's like, you have to draw the entire square, right, if you're going to write down a fiber product, otherwise it just feels wrong. So, what this gets you is it gets you a map to the, the cross, the, the, the fiber product, um, and, well, that map is an embedding because this one is, right? So, you get a closed immersion, into P and one cross P and two. And then that of course embeds via the Segre embedding inside some big projective space. And then, you know, this embedding is via, you know, the first divisor on one factor, the second divisor on the other. This is via one one. So then this embedding is via the sum. This guy will be M1 plus M2 H plus D. Now, of course, uh, I also could have just done this with M2H. And so not only do I get that I have a big multiple of H plus D is very ample, but then so is that big multiple of H. So that gives me the divisors A and B. So, you know, with this notation, I have that uh, here I would take A is equal to M1 plus M2H plus B, and then B is equal to just M1 plus M2H. Okay, and so then this shows that any divisor, you can write it as a difference of two very ample divisors. And this is quite nice because, you know, very ample divisors, you know, they correspond to embeddings in projective space, they do hold on a bunch of great stuff for us. Um, and so, yeah, so this is going to give us kind of a nice construction that will help us prove our numerical criteria.
Wait, what was the argument that it's base point free? Oh, because uh, that's, so an ample divisor makes things globally generated. And base point free is the same as globally generated. Yeah, but why is the sum Oh, because you just take M2 big enough. Oh, okay. oh I mean, so this is like, uh, if you want to think of this as a sheaf, it would be O of D tensored with, you know. Yeah, so it's not just because M2 H is very M2. No? That's right, yeah, yeah. So, you know, you, you know, it's the sort of thing where you, so we picked it very ample such that this holds and this holds. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, if this is very ample, then there's no guarantee this is very point free because you can just take d like, you know, negative twice that, right? Yeah, that's that's quite true. But the point is that you know you can just by making is you fix d and then by making m big enough you can make all these things true simultaneously. That's the that's the idea of the argument. So yeah, the thing that's fixed is d, and h is also fixed, and then the m's are letting you scale up. Okay, so an immediate nice consequence of this is that we get that ample divisors, this property being ample, is well behaved under changing the divisor slightly. So if you add a tiny divisor to an ample divisor, it stays ample. Let's say that as a corollary. So given a ample, uh, I don't want to use A or I want to use H. Let's just say H. Uh, you have an H ample and D Cartier divisor. Then for epsilon small, but you know you want it to be greater than zero, we have that H minus or H plus epsilon d is ample. And it's just you run the same argument just like before, and you say, oh, okay, right? Like, you, you just do exactly this, and then the idea is that whatever your epsilon is, you can find m1 and m2 such that 1 over m1 plus m2 is bigger than epsilon, and then you've done this thing. So essentially, I'm showing you the ample cone is open. Now, to really make this statement precise, I, you know, like everything that's happening here is with, with, like, Cartier divisors. Or, I mean, you, you're allowed to scale up by an integer, so I can think of these as being Q Cartier divisors. But really, I want to use R coefficients if I want to make a statement like this. Because I'd really like it to be like, oh, it's like, you know, it's a convex cone in a real space. And, you know, it requires a little more formalism, which I'm not really going to get into, but you can totally do that. And I, uh, I recommend looking at Lazarus Feld's book if you are curious about that. The R divisor thing is kind of funny because, you know, when I first learned about it, I was kind of like, oh, yeah, this is just, you know, kind of a small technical thing and it's not really very important. And then I saw, uh, at one point I saw James McKernan giving a series of lectures which I think was supposed to be on, I think it was supposed to give lectures on, on like something completely different, but he like talked about the minimal model program instead. Um, I think he was supposed to talk about like birational automorphism or something. But, uh, uh, and he was kind of saying, well, you know, you have to really have to use R divisors. He's like, I mean, I guess you could use like, you could use approximation by Q divisors, but at that point you're just using R divisors, just, you know, you didn't like unpack all the formalism. So it turns out these like, these kind of like small analysis arguments that kind of show up in this because you're like messing around with convex bodies, like you really do need to do that analysis sometimes. It's kind of funny how that works out. Okay, so, all right. So the, the two numerical statements about ample divisors I wanted to make today. So one of them is, uh, the Kleinman criterion for ampleness, which says that essentially what I wrote on the board, that the neth cone is the closure of the ample cone, and the ample cone is the interior of the neth cone. So, and what this boils down to is just saying that 
if you want to know if a divisor is ample, then you just have to test what it looks like on curves. So you can just test amp, uh, the property being ample, which you know maybe you call this ampleness or maybe you call it amplitude. Um, you can test that on curves. So to get to that statement, we need another criterion for ampleness, which is the nakai moishizan criterion, which relates being ample with just being positive. So I'm going to state that one next. Okay, cool. All right, so. So, okay, so divisor D on X is ample if and only if. For all v, and this is say irreducible subvarieties of x, but this is not proper though. This could be just all of x. In fact, that's very important. Uh, so for all subvarieties, that uh, if I take v to the n minus k with e to the k, this is positive. And then this is, you know, in the correct dimension. So the co-dimension of v is e to the k. Okay, so in particular, we need that the nth power of d, the self-intersection, is positive. Okay, so... Why is it dk? Oh, you're right. So it's just this. There we go. Um, hang on. Now do I... that means I want the dimension of v to the k. Okay. All right. We'll get the statement right eventually. Okay. So if the ah wait, maybe I do want the co-dimension. Okay. Okay. Um. Yes, it is the co-dimension because if the co-dimension if the co-dimension is n minus 1, then I get a 1 here. So, anyway, so the point, yeah, and then the, if v is just x, then this should be an n. Right. So, basically, you take this, the highest intersection number of the divisor, you just get, you restrict the divisor to your subvariety, and then you just take the highest intersection that you can until you get a bunch of points, and it's a positive number of points. Okay, so this is the Nakai and Moishe's own criterion. And it's quite nice, right? That for one thing, uh, it means that the uh, whether or not your divisor is ample depends only on the numerical class, which is not something that's immediately obvious. Okay, so when I was planning on presenting this, I was really like, how do I get at Feynman's criterion, which um, is the one that you really use the most, because that's the one that only depends on curves. Um, and then, you know, I looked at Lazarsfeld's book and realized the proof was a lot more involved. I mean, it's not really like, there's not really any like heavy technical machinery. It's just, you know, you do some clever ploys with divisors, but it was like a little more involved than I realized. So here I'm presenting Lazarsfeld's proof of uh, this, uh, the, the proof that's in Lazarsfeld of this theorem. And we'll use that to prove Kleinman's criterion. Okay, so to prove this, so we're going to use induction on the dimension of x. Uh, 
Now you notice, like, I didn't state any hypotheses for this theorem because, you know, I mean, if you really want to know the exact statement, you should look it up uh, because, you know, in lectures one, it's a little, a little loose with things. But, uh, uh, you know, one thing here is like one, in, one, one uh, assumption that goes into a lot of theorems that you really don't actually want to assume here is that x is projective. Because it would be really nice to use this to prove that x is projective, right? Because uh, that's kind of the best way to prove something is projective is to exhibit an ample divisor. Uh, and in fact, this, you know, you know, there's no proper variety where you have a divisor like this that isn't already projective. So uh, you don't, to prove this, you don't have to assume x is projective, but I'm going to because it makes your life a lot easier. But, you know, Lazarus felt there's a comment about this and gives a reference for proving it in proper case. Okay, so, so one thing we're gonna need is we'll need asymptotic Riemann rock theorem. And the form we're gonna use here is that if I take the dimension of the space of global sections of uh, a large power of my divisor, then, or wait, I don't actually want that. I want the Euler characteristic. Okay, so I want the Euler characteristic. The whole point of using the Euler characteristic is to get at the space of sections. And then this is going to be the self-intersection number divided by n factorial times n to the n plus lower order terms. So in particular, if my self-intersection, that top number is positive, then the Euler characteristic of the divisor as you take powers and powers is going to get bigger and bigger. And so what we'd like to show is that the that contribution is coming from h0. So, you know, the point of this theorem, I mean, really, what you're after with Riemann rock type theorems is you're after, like, how many global sections does this divisor have? At least generally speaking, you know, if it's an ample divisor, all the higher cohomology is going to eventually vanish. So, this is really about h0. I mean, this is how you use Riemann rock for Hertz, right? Is that, you know, you kind of maneuver yourself into a position where you know something about the h1. You know, maybe you can pair it off, maybe you can just say that it's zero, and then you're getting at the sections of whatever line bundle you're looking for. Okay, so we conclude that this Euler characteristic is positive for M large. Okay, so, so now what we want to do is we want to use the result that I had before where you can write d as a difference of ample divisors. And this is where we're assuming that x is projective, even though the actual theorem doesn't require that assumption. So if I write d as being equivalent to a minus b, and these are both very ample divisors, then I can get a handle on what the uh, global sections of D look like, but also what the higher cohomology looks like, because what we want to happen is for it to vanish. So I get two different exact sequences here. So, so both of these start with MD minus B. Here I multiply by a, here I multiply by b, this gives me o of m plus 1 d, this gives me o of m d, uh, and then here I'm restricting to a, and then here I restrict to b. Okay, and so 
the idea here is that you know we chose these to be very ample divisors, but we can even you know we can choose them to have all their higher cohomology vanish. So we can just uh, assume that um, let's see. Yeah, it's a I guess it's a bit tricky because it's like okay. Like what are we holding fixed and what what's what's uh, what's not changing? But for any m, you know you can. Oh right, here's the point. Um, yeah, so the point is that, um, you know, in particular, here and here. So the inductive hypothesis tells us that d is an ample divisor when you restrict it to any subright. So this is ample and ample. Um, and so in particular, you get vanishing of uh, cohomology here and here. So we have that for m really large, that the hi of o of a m plus 1 d uh, equals 0 hi of O B M D equals zero for I greater than zero. And so that means that these two terms, they're you're not gonna be able to say the higher cohomology vanishes, but it stabilizes. So we have that so uh, H H two through H N stabilize. For O of MD. Okay, well, that means that if we go back to this Euler characteristic, then this Euler characteristic is an alternating sum of the ranks of all the cohomology groups. So if we know that the ones at the end stabilize and we're tracking this asymptotically, then as a function, the, this part has to be dealt with by the H0 and the H1. So what we can say then is that we have chi of uh, O of MD. Well, this is going to equal the H0 minus the H1 plus you know, the H2 minus the H3 plus dot, dot, dot. But all of these, these are going to be some constant terms. So because of the stabilization of this exact sequence, these terms are all constant. And so we get that this, this guy is growing really fast, like uh, you know, some multiple of m to the n, the n, n factorial m to the n. And so we conclude that h0 is positive. So this is a lot of work just to obtain one single section of O of md. But it turns out this is kind of the thing that can go wrong if you don't have the positive self-intersection is that D might just not have any sections and no multiple of it will have any sections. So next time I'll show you some examples of what can go wrong when you know when you you almost have this criterion met but not quite by the the that the top self-intersection is zero. Okay, so this is non-zero. And you know, at this point, because we're tracking whether a divisor is ample, I can always replace d by a multiple of d. So I might as well assume that h0 of d is non-zero. Um, you know, just I can just replace d by md, and it, you know, it doesn't make any difference because the uh, the thing I'm trying to prove is that d is ample, which is you know, it's enough to prove that for md. Okay, so. Now we've obtained a section. Now that's great, because now what we can do is we can write down another exact sequence. So the usual exact sequence we write down is you have O of uh, MD to O of uh, M plus 1D to O of D of M. 1D. 
Okay, and again, this guy is ample. So here, just by like taking m large enough, again, this is kind of a new m, this is something you do in birational geometry a lot, is you're sort of replacing, you're saying, okay, well now we replace like 100 times your divisor, we call that the original divisor, and you know, we just start repeating this thing, so, yeah, I mean, then he kind of raises the question of like, well, how large or not large does m have to be? And that's sort of, you know, an entire separate set of questions. Um, yeah, so this is ample. So again, we get this cohomological vanishing business. Um, so in particular, so, you know, let's just look at what's happening with the long exact sequence. So, we have, uh, well, the, yeah, so let's just write the whole thing down. H0 of x O of md to H0 of x O of m plus 1d, and then H zero D O of M D uh, M plus one here. Okay, so that's the right number of parentheses. And then it keeps going. We have H one of X O of M D H one of X. O M plus one D and then we have a zero. Okay, so our goal is gonna to be to show that this map here is surjective. Because this is how we prove that things are ample, that we, how we prove things are finitely generated, is we lift sections. So the idea is that if you can is that here, you know, D is ample. So these sections they are base point free on D. So for every point on D, you can find a section here that doesn't vanish. So if this map were subjective, then I could just lift, and that would get me base point freeness, uh, because I know that, well, I can avoid all the points that are not on D. So this tells me I can avoid the points on D as well. Okay, so that would be great. So what we need is for this map here to be injective. Well, we know that this map is surjective. And then, well, what do we have? As we go further and further along, we get more and more surjective maps. So I have a tower of maps of vector spaces. These are finite dimensional vector spaces. So if I keep taking surjective maps, eventually I can't get any smaller. So, if that, so the dimension is decreasing. So eventually it has to be equal. And once it's equal, we have an isomorphism. So the dimension of H1 X O of M D, or let's say M plus 1 D, decreases. And eventually stabilizes. So uh, let's just call this map, I don't know, A, the map A is eventually an isomorphism. Okay, and as I mentioned before, once this is an isomorphism, then this map is surjective, I can lift sections and that makes D, it's a multiple of D, a base point free divisor. So, you know, hence MD for large M is base point free. Okay, well, once you have a base point free divisor, then you can make a map.
Okay, so then we have that uh, X maps to some projective space via MD. And we know this is a well-defined map. And then the fibers, well, we don't know that this is an embedding, but we do know that the fibers are finite because any positive dimensional variety that is in the in the pre, that's that's a fiber of this map if you intersect d with that well then you would get zero because d maps you over here but by hypothesis you always get something positive so this intersection thing this d, d dot uh, d to the n minus k i should have just said the dimension of d shouldn't i uh, anyway, I'm following Lazarus Feltz's notation, so he probably had a good reason for doing it this way, and uh, but I didn't copy what the reason was. So this guy is positive, so the map is finite, and then you know, so then cohomology calculations, you know, if you have higher cohomology vanishing here, it has to vanish here, and if you look at the, the direct image functors, like the higher direct images all vanish. So you can conclude that that a line bundle that's ample here, namely D, pulls back to one that's ample here. So hence D is ample. Okay, and so that you know concludes proof of the, the kind of Lorentz zone criterion. So this part was a little bit fast. So how do we get from from the finite mass that it's actually injective? Uh, sorry, that what's in well, oh, oh, we're not claiming that this is an embedding. We're just oh, claiming okay. that oh. D is an ample divisor. Oh, okay. So, yeah, so the idea is that, um, you know, so you use the other way of, of saying things are ample, that they make cohomology vanish. Um, and so the idea is that you say, okay, well, what's my, you, you use the projection formula, you say, well, you know, you call this map F, and then, you know, given some sheaf F on X, what is it? It's like uh, F, lower star of F, tensor like O of N. Uh, if I pull that back, then this should be isomorphic to, Yeah, so it'll be like a even larger multiple. Yeah, I guess it should, yeah, there's some, yeah, okay, so so let's see, I can't quite remember what the statement is, but, but basically, you push it forward, compute the cohomology there, pull it back, and you see it vanishes. Yes, yes. Yeah, so you can see how it works. So it's not this in the... Yeah, yeah, so it's, yeah, so you're not using the geometric version, you're using the cohomological version and the geometric version at the same time. Yeah, so just to reiterate that, the way finiteness comes into play is that it says that any cohomology calculation you want to do here, you can really do here, and it's not really going to mess anything up in terms of the higher cohomology because this has relative dimension zero. So here we know it vanishes because D gives you an ample divisor over here. You can pull that back, it's still ample. You know, if most people ask me, oh, why is a finite map preserved ample divisor, I would say, well, it's still positive on all the curves, but that's what we're trying to prove. So I can't, I can't pull that one out today. Okay, so we got about 10 minutes left. I'm trying to wonder if that's enough to do the other theorem. Yeah, I mean, maybe. Um, let me pause for questions, though. Okay, well, we'll, uh, we'll start the proof of the other theorem and see how far we get. Um, so, one question, I, I, yeah. I believe I'm maybe on this. Why did you use the fact that you, before you want to prove there exist sections? Yes. Why did you use it this here? Oh, well, I use it, I use that there's a section so that the, I can make the divisor base point free. So, which is, it's a little bit funny, right? Because it's like, oh, you know, being base point free is like a lot stronger than having a section, right? In this result here, uh, this part here. You... Oh, okay, so here's the idea is that I have, 
Okay, so this is multiplication by each, right? So, yeah, so the idea is that here you have a bunch of sections that don't vanish along D, because this is the kernel of this map, right? Okay, okay. So this map is restriction to D, and then this is the kernel, which is everything that, uh, the image of this is the kernel, which is uh, all the stuff that goes to zero, right? So, um, now the point here is that I want to show that, that there, you know, so it's clear that if I have a section that it's base point free away from the section itself. That's correct. Right? So we just have to show it's base point free along the section. And uh, this restricted have, thing. Okay, you need a section there. Okay. Yeah, so you need a section so you have you somewhere to lift from. So, yeah, so because what you argue is that you could you have enough sections to not be base free. Right, so you have enough sections that you're base point free along here. Yeah. Right? And then, but then, like, but then it's like, okay, but that doesn't guarantee anything. But that's where we need the, the statement here that I can actually lift. Right. So there, you know, so there's something something going along here to make it so that, oh, I can actually lift but sections up to here. You show that, okay, so you, you, you show that eventually you reject it. Therefore, sections extend. Yes. That shows sections exist, right? No, 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 okay. If that shows that. base point freeness. Like, you need at least one section to do this at all. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, this is like kind of a common like right, right. problem in birational geometry. Actually, like it's sort of like once you get one section, your life is a lot easier. But you know, like the like with the abundance conjecture, you know, we it's like if you can get one section, like things are like generally. I mean, it's maybe. I mean, it, it's still a non-trivial problem, but it's like we don't even know how to get the one section. Right. But like once you have a one section, then it's sort of like you have a handhold for doing something with. Yeah, but it's a bit subtle. I mean, this is why when I was like preparing this, I was like, oh yeah, this is like, you know, I mean, there's nothing like really, you know, really crazy about this argument, but it's like a bunch of like clever tricks, right? That, uh, you know, I don't know how one would like really reproduce this argument. You know, I mean, it was the sort of thing where I was like looking it up, I was like, oh, this was like more involved than I realized. Um, especially like the part I erased where there's like the two exact sequences. It's like anytime you're starting down two exact sequences at the same time, you know, you're in trouble, right? Okay, other questions? I think I should probably not start the next proof because we'll get like, we have like seven minutes and I'll get like seven minutes in and then I'll, we'll just have to restart it again on Monday. So. Uh, any other questions? Okay, so let me just briefly say, like, talk about like what is like a little bit confusing about this, is if you think about like the surface case, so warning. So a divisor, which is positive on every curve, need not be ample. Okay, well we know that a divisor on a curve which is positive is ample on the curve. So, you know, if we're looking for a counterexample, we have to go up to at least dimension two. And so for a surface, so we may have uh, you know we may have d dot c greater than zero for all c, but d squared. So it turns out like I think you can't make d squared negative for this, but you could have that d squared is equal to zero. And the point here is that D itself is not a curve because D doesn't have any sections. So if D had a section, then these two statements you know, would not be compatible because D would itself be a curve if we're on a surface. So how do you cook up an example like this? Well, there's a lot of ways of doing it um, to kind of 
you know, I think the simplest example you can cook up is you can, uh, you know, you can look at vector bundles on curves, take the projectivization, and you know, based on properties of the vector bundle, you can cook this up. Basically, if you take a vector bundle, which is, I think it's you want one that's semi-stable but uh, not strictly so, or something. It's something to do with like the line between semi-stability and stability that basically boils down to at kind of the edge of the effective cone, you have something which is not itself effective and no power of it is. Uh, but another way you can do this is you can take, uh, uh, you can take P2, you can take nine, uh, and then you choose Yes, so you can choose uh, E uh, smooth cubic, and then you blow up nine very general points on E. Uh, and then the point of doing this is that if you take the strict transform of E and I restrict it to itself, it's going to be equal to uh, three times the hyperplane class, the pullback of the hyperplane, which was just you know the intersection downstairs, and then I subtract the sum of the pi. Okay, and then the point is, what is this class? Well, we have no idea, right? But if I pick the points general enough, then this is a very general class, and it's non-torsion. So we can make this non-torsion. So that in particular means that, or wait, this has a section, so this can't work. Um, let's see, this is not the one I want. Never mind. This is a different counterexample. So yeah, let me uh, let me get back to you on the the counterexample to this. So there's one that's like pretty straightforward to write down with uh, um, where you just have a uh, where you have a surface where you just have like curve classes that don't uh, quite line up. Um, yeah, for this one, yeah, I remembered the wrong counterexample, I think, so uh, we'll revisit this one next time. Uh, so next time we'll talk about Kleinman's criterion, um, and, you know, time permitting, I'll go over some of these, like, funny counterexamples for surfaces for uh, divisors and amplitude. Okay, so I think I will stop here.